and it's automatically recording. All right, hello there. You are just in time. We're just getting started. And so are you. Hey, how's it going? All righty. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm sure we're going to have other people that join us. Is that a noise? Okay. All right. <laughs> so um, today we're going to be talking about which certification is right for my business and um, just kind of narrow your certification options. Um, this work. Okay, so two weeks ago we talked about what certifications are and what they are not. And last week we discussed all the reasons why you should get your business certified. And, um, you know, which just the plethora of reasons to do that and, and the benefits of it. And today we're going to wrap it all up talking about what certification or certifications may be right for your business. So um, feel free to, I, I'm very open for questions, interrupt me as we go along, and I'll answer questions as we go. But there are a ton of certification choices out there, okay? You can do certifications through the SBA, through a minority business enterprise, women business enterprise. If you're a veteran, you can do your veteran certifications. So there are a ton of options, cities, states, municipalities, DOT, the options are legion. So Right, right. Well, no, that's not correct. You can absolutely do business even if you are not certified. Think about Lockheed Martin. They don't have certification. I mean, they're the biggest federal contractor in the world. So um, certifications are not required to do certification, um, to do business. But what they do allow you as small businesses, it's, it gives you a competitive advantage because otherwise you can't compete <laughs> against Lockheed. So you're playing in a kiddie pool that Lockheed Martin can't get into. You know, so yeah, that's the one of the reasons for certifications. And we kind of talk about some of those, I think it's in last week's class and the week before. So um, you can go through, I think we've got them posted online, um, you know, on any one of our social media sites or YouTube or, or what have you. And you can watch um, the couple of videos, but I am going to discuss some of that in just a bit. Okay, so to answer the question about which certifications are right for you, we need to, I need to answer the question with a question. Don't you hate when people do that? First of all, you've got to ask yourself, who are your clients? And that's one of those where you kind of need to get really deep. You may already know the, the answer to the question, but if your clients are, are corporations like your Coca-Cola's and UPS and, and other companies like that, then you know you need to get a certification that speaks to those clients. If your clients are going to be government agencies, um, like you said, you used to do business with, you used to work with DOD and didn't work within them. So if that's where you're going back to, then that ask, answers your question about which certification you should get. If your clients are government, are they city, state, local, municipal type governments? Or is it federal government? Because again, two different animals. So you've got to have the certification that speaks to the right agency. So, and again, the questions are important because it helps you to identify which, what is important to the client you serve. Because all this is about making sure that your end user, your end client gets what they want from you. Okay, so if they want a certified business, you need to get the one that speaks the language of that person you're working with. Okay, so, um, and again, the smart thing, if you know who your ideal client is, you can spend your time, your money, getting the certification that speaks directly to that client. Okay, so let's go talk about corporate clients. So corporate clients um, are motivated differently than federal clients, okay? So they're motivated by shareholders, by bottom line profit, um, sometimes by... Um, public perception, often by public perception. So that's kind of drives what they do. So depending on what's going on in the world, like, you know, the, think about where we are right now as a society where, you know, the Me Too movement and transgender is all in the news and different things like that. So depending on how progressive the company is, they may, may make policies, corporate-wide policies around how they do business with those segments of population. So minority or women business enterprise are important for corporations. Um, better known small businesses. I remember, was, when did I leave the bank? 2012, around 2011 and 12, 
like every major company out there just had big veteran initiatives talking about how they hire veterans and so much of their workforce was going to be a percentage of veterans and all that. So it's kind of like the flavor of the month. I mean, it's <laughs> maybe sad, but true, you know, so just know, have your finger on the pulse of what's going on, especially if corporations are your clients and know what's important to them so that you can, you know, tailor your, your, your certifications to their needs. And then, of course, the LGBTBE certification, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender business enterprise. You're not going to see that all over corporate America. But, you know, if, you, if it's a corporation based in California or somewhere on the West Coast, you're going to believe that they have a lot of those programs set up. But they're just a little more progressive because they're, again, tailoring to their audience and what's going on. And, you know, public perception or, or you know, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so government clients. If your clients are the CDC or FEMA or the prison systems, uh, Department of Justice, or any other health and human services, or, or wherever you want to do business with the federal government, then these are the programs that are important for them. It's the 8A Business Development Program, the Historically Underutilized Business Development Zone, which is Hub Zone, um, SD, VOSB, or Veteran Owned Small Business, and then uh, SD stands for Service Disabled. And then, of course, your economically disadvantaged or woman-owned small business certification. And the ones that have slashes next to mean two distinct certifications. So just because you served and you are a veteran doesn't necessarily make you service disabled or you don't necessarily have a service-connected disability. Um, oftentimes, I get the question, um, if, they, if you are a veteran and you do have a service-connected disability, as far as what percentage of disabled you have to be, if you have that letter saying that you have a service-connected disability, it can be 1%. I don't think it's that low, but, you know, it doesn't matter what the percentage is. As long as you have that designation from the Veterans Administration that you have that service-connected disability, then you can qualify for the service-disabled veteran on small business. Um, economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business just means that you meet certain economic disadvantage criteria. And I talked a little about that yesterday as far as the details of, of what constitutes economic disadvantage. And that, um, that changes depending on the certification you're looking at. If you are looking at an 8A business development program, your economic disadvantage criteria is going to be different than if you're looking at a, a woman-owned small business. And it just depends on the certification as to what that criteria is. And I'll be going into a few more details about some of these certifications. So if you have specific questions about whether or not you qualify for, you know, economically disadvantaged woman versus 8A, then I can talk to you about it. 51%. Every certification, and we're going to get into some of the specifics about ownership. But... Um, Every, in any scenario, whether it's woman or minority or veteran or whatever, the, the, what they call disadvantaged individual, that person that's qualifying as either the veteran or the woman or the minority has to own at least 51% of the company in order for, um, for it to be considered. Okay. And uh, the other thing is that ownership can be made up of two or more individuals. So if it's a, a business where you know you've got four owners at 25 percent across the board three of them can constitute that you know if three of them are veterans then they can do the better if three are women they can do the woman if it's three owners at 33 and a half a third percent piece then two of the three can qualify as either woman better and whatever okay any questions so far okay cool so municipal clients um, if you are doing business with states or counties or municipalities, then um, the certifications that talk to those um, organizations are like your, your DOT certification, your Department of Transportation. Yes, Department of Transportation is a federal department, <laughs> but they have a disadvantaged business enterprise certification for each individual state. So Florida has one, Georgia has one, North Carolina, North Dakota, every state has one. And depending on the state, in most states, it's true 
that the state recognizes that as the sort of um, as the certification of choice, if you will. Like here in the state of Georgia, if you're trying to do business with the state of Georgia and they are looking for a certification preference, they're looking to see if you have that DOT through the Georgia Department of Transportation. Uh, also keep in mind that because DOT is a federal agency, they've got one federal set of rules. Although each individual state has their own certifying body basically with the Florida Department of Transportation versus Georgia versus California or what, whatever state you're in. So oftentimes because of that, they, uh, many of the states have reciprocity, meaning if you, let's say you have two locations here in Florida, uh, Georgia and South Carolina, then you get your, your business certified here in Georgia, oftentimes you can go to South Carolina and present your Georgia certification and without all of this legion of paperwork you had to submit to Georgia, they can just give you the South Carolina version so that you can easily do business there. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's uh, the DOT DBE, which is Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. And then many counties will have something called a local small business enterprise. DeKalb County is a good example of that. Clayton County is another example of that right here, where they have, um, their own designation within the county that they call local small business enterprise. And that just means they have a, a series of paperwork and qualifications that you have to meet in order to qualify. You submit that paperwork to their the county and then they certify you as an LSB. Um, yes. Do you know Cobb County? No. <laughs> Nor does Gwinnett. Those are the two. I mean, and Gwinnett's like one of the most diverse counties in state and yeah uh, although what who is the person that reached out to us from Gwinnett I mean but she's a, a, a DBE coordinator so that that's good news that Gwinnett is coming up with yeah <laughs> this novel idea this brand new thing <laughs> but um and I think the reason is because of the recent legislation that was passed expanding MARTA so they are doing that specifically to, to link in with the Department of Transportation, Florida expansion as a use of that county. So that leads me to believe that Cobb County will eventually follow suit with something like that. So, um, yeah. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, what was I going to say about local small business enterprise? Okay. Um, and I talked a little bit about this last week. The benefits of having certifications with municipalities is that oftentimes when a municipality is awarding a contract, they generally go by something called a scoring system. So they're going to score it based on your, the credibility of your, um, or the relevance of your past performance, how it relates to the project that they're requesting, um, the time in business and the strength of your financials or whatever category they choose. All of that will be outlined in the solicitation telling you exactly how they're going to score the project. Oftentimes, if they do have a project out for bid, if you are, let's say, an LSBE within DeKalb County, they're going to give you an additional five or ten points by being an LSB. Um, DeKalb County has something called an MSA, LSBE, Metropolitan Statistical Area, and that just means your business is not in DeKalb, but it's in one of the Metropolitan Statistical Area counties. Um, so if you are a Gwinnett County business and you're certifying in DeKalb County, maybe you're not going to get 10 points, you're only going to get five because you're an MSA LSB as opposed to a DeKalb County business that would get the full 10 because they're right there in DeKalb. Okay? So, um, and then city, county, uh, disadvantaged business enterprise. So like City of Atlanta has their own certification process um, and they certify African American, Asian Pacific American, Hispanic American. I mean, they literally break it down by, by ethnic category. Uh, women, minority, small, they, they do everything. And the good thing about the city of Atlanta is they do one of the better jobs of tracking it by category. So they know how much of their contracting dollars are going to um, African American businesses versus Asian businesses versus Hispanic and all that kind of stuff. So. What else did I have here? I think that's it. Okay, so let's talk about 
federal certifications and what the qualifications are for them. Okay, so any federal certification, and that means if it's if it's um, issued by either SBA or VA, and that's going to be your hub zones, your 8As, your, your um, service disabled veteran owned, your woman owned uh, small business, and di economically disadvantaged woman small business. You must be a U.S. citizen, period, end of story. There is no qualification if you are not a citizen. That is going to be first and foremost. You also must be small according to SBA size standards. And this is a moving target depending on your business. So if it's all going to be based on um, the NAICS codes of your business. And um, it's either going to be determined by the number of employees you have or the revenue that your business generates per month. So um, if you've got questions about that, I can actually, let's see if we can hop over to there real quick now. Um, that means I'm gonna have to, y'all will have to bear with me as I go back into the PowerPoint, but there is <clears throat> something called an electronic code of federal regulations ecfr.gov and this is your resource for everything related to certifications um, but in basically anything related to government contracting I don't recommend you read it all because it's ridiculous <laughs> I mean so any kind of federal program whatever is governed by rules in the code of federal regulations they generally update this every day, <laughs> except this has only been updated since December 31st. I imagine the shutdown has something to do with that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> we got a little bit of catching up to do. <laughs> so um, Title 13 is going to be where most of the information about certifications is going to be found, unless you're a veteran. Do we have any veterans in the room? Okay, veteran, I can never remember where it is. I always have to go hunting for it. I think it's 49. I'll find out where it is. It's 40 something. Or maybe, nope, it's 38. So under Title 38 would be all of your stuff about veterans. But everyone else, Title 13 is where you're going to find information about hub zone, 8A, woman owned, economically disadvantaged, woman owned, small business. Title 38 is where you go to find specifics about veterans. Okay. Um, before you go down this rabbit hole, call me first. <laughs> Not unless you're a nerd and you just like doing this, which is, you know, I'm guilty as charged, which is why I really get you down about this stuff. Don't tell them. Okay. <laughs> and then, I mean, the thing is, I was a banker before, so, you know, I discovered all this in banking because this governs business loans, anything related to, like, so if you're doing an SBA loan, or a VA loan, or any, all of the rules and regs are here in the Code of Federal Regulations. Okay, but when it comes to small business size regulations, yeah, and that's going to be Title 13, Section 121.101. Um, subsection 121.201. This is literally a whole size standard. Um, Spread, spreadsheet based on Nate's code. So you can see that um, just according to this, based on the top line, it, it goes by your Nate's code, which is your North American Industrial Classification System Code. Yes, we do speak governance fluently here. We are coming out with the dictionaries <laughs> to help those of you that are not yet fluent in the language. <laughs> so, um, you know, it does tell you kind of what it is too. So it has a, a brief Nate's description and it tells you the size standard it's either going to be based on dollars or number of employees never both okay so um and i don't know anybody's next code offhand you do you do you know yours i can find it census.gov oh uh, myra why didn't i do forward slash next Okay, so if you need to find your your NAICS codes, census, usCensus.gov forward slash NAICS. Oh, 
look at you. Five, three, one, who? Yeah. Five, three, one, two. Oh, that's real estate. Okay. So, and we there's all kinds of different ones. So, agents and brokers, residential property manager, all that good stuff. But for you, your NAICS code is a seven and a half million dollar code. So that means as long as your business is seven and a half million dollars or less, then you are considered small. Okay. Now, um, what what else do you do in your business though? Real estate development. I mean, because all of your codes, unless you get into leasing, leasing of property, um, do you do any leasing of property? Well, does that, is that, okay, so if you are a commercial real estate agent and you're leasing a building to the government, is that a lesser? A, oh, oh, okay. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, see, you talked about something today. <laughs> so, um, right, right. The reason I'm asking is because seven and a half million, I know we're kind of snickering like, wow, I got a long time before I get too big to be small. But if you do government contracting correctly and you end up with a $5 million three year contract, if you get a couple of those, you're going to quickly grow out of the seven and a half million dollar code. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did y'all have a question? Dr. Dave, do y'all have a question? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, and we're recording this, so if we don't mind, I mean, we can save the questions or just ask me and I'll make sure I answer them so we can not interrupt the flow of what's going on. Great. And I'm sorry, what was your question? Right. You know, it doesn't hurt you for getting future government contracts, but it no longer allows you to participate as a small business in the particular program that may have given you the advantage to win those contracts. So um, let's say you are in this business of real estate agent and broker. I imagine just because you're in real estate, you probably have to do or partner with people to do renovation and constructions of property, right? So, uh, and where is that? Let me see if I can figure that out. Construction. Okay, so construction. Management. Construction, residential construction, or general contractor. So if you have a, and maybe we want to do it for like apartment buildings or multifamily or commercial, where do, are you seeing it? Yeah, I mean, there, uh, yeah, it's in here somewhere. I just don't see it right now. Multifamily. Because I'm thinking, you know, like if you get, um, did you see that somewhere? Which one is it? Two, three, four, four up. Four. Oh, there we go. Okay. Two, three, six, one, one, six. Okay. So let's look at the two, three, six, one, one, six. Two, three, six, one, one, six. So if you are a new multifamily housing construction business, then you're. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So any, but any of these codes, you see, this is a $36.5 million code. So, you know, this is where you're smart and strategic about how you do things. For your NAICS codes, when you're filling out your SAM profile, you include that you are a real estate broker and that you do construction and all of that. And then you might want to indicate that construction is your primary. So that gives you a lot more runway to grow before you get too small, too big to be small anymore. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, guys, <laughs> like, don't move that. 
So uh, 236, 220, 236, 116, and you may want to use all of these that are applicable for your business. You know, I mean, if you one day want to lease out industrial buildings and you need someone to do that, you want the 236, 210. Okay, no worries. And then the other great thing too is that if you're in any kind of utilities, if you are a farmer in agriculture or any of that kind of stuff, you're going to see that. Um, so mining and oil and gas and all that, well, except for oil and gas, but mining is a a an employee driven number. And several of these were the manufacturers. Yeah utilities and there's something else where farmers and food manufacturing so if you manufacture any kind of food including dog and cat food by the way i did not realize that until now <laughs> but food manufacturing utilities um any kind of mining these are employee driven code, uh, codes and you have to be a huge company to be to have 1500 employees i mean you're you're hundreds of millions of dollars to have that many employees so that's how you see these mammoth companies getting these small business contracts and you're like dude they got 750 employees how are they small because they have a code that's driven by number of employees as opposed to dollars so just keep in mind and be smart and strategic about how you do things now of course you can't you can't be a a real estate construction company and mine for gold too right <laughs> So you've got it, it's got to relate, but but just keep in mind that that's how this is how you can position yourself and, and and you know structure your business so that you can you can stay within the programs and stay within the letter of the law um, for quite a bit of time. Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yes. So, but um, just keep that in mind. Okay, so now back to the PowerPoint. And let's see if this is going to let me do it. It always does that. Sorry. Okay, get back to where I was. Get back to the right view. Okay. Oh, and I know how to do it now. Huh? Okay, so um, federal certifications. How did I get on? Oh, that we were talking about small. Okay, so that was the second criteria. You have to be small according to SBA size standards. You must be a for-profit business. So this is certifications aren't aren't for not-for-profits. Um, so that's great. Build up your nonprofit arm to you know, I don't want to say siphon off revenue. That sounds really bad. But <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to help, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so you do that later, but you, your for-profit business is the one that you're certifying and getting your contracts with. Um, and you must meet whatever eligibility criteria, you know, as far as being the veteran or the woman or the what have you. Um, also, for most of the federal certifications, they want to see that you're devoted to your business full time. So what that's going to mean in reality is that if you present a W-2 from XYZ employer, and why would you have to present a W-2, you ask? Because they asked for three years of cash <laughs> This is a very deep dive. So let me just say that first of all. If you are not ready to, and excuse my crassness, and there are men in the room, but lift the skirts and let government see everything underneath, you are not ready for certifications, okay? This is going to be a very, very, um, what, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of the word. I'm, I'm looking for, but they ask for everything, and it's not one of those. Why do they want that? They want it because you, you know, like your mom used to say, because I said so. <laughs> so if you aren't willing to give it to them, then certification is not something to consider. You've got to be willing to give them what they ask for, and it's not one of those. I can, I, I give them just a piece of it and not the rest of it. They have some of the most sophisticated forensic financial people I've ever encountered, here. and. That was surprising to me because I, you know, kind of thought, you know, there's government precision with the military, but then also government and efficiency on the rest of it, right? So I assumed that, oh, they won't look at everything. I mean, it's one of those where if you forget to tell them about a business that you had 10 years ago that you filed a tax return on, and they ask, have you ever owned any other businesses? 
they will be asking you, well, tell me about Joe Blow Band that you had back in 1994. And they did that with one of my clients. He was like, wow, I didn't even know they could find that out. I forgot about it. So you don't want to ever be in a case where you're willfully withholding information because then that's going to speak to, um, I didn't put it up here. Um, what are they, the character is a big factor in some of these where they, you know, ask about your criminal record and all that kind of stuff. Not to say that if you had some minor misdemeanor back in your college days because you did something really stupid that you can't get certified because I've helped people that have had criminal history get certified. But you need to be forthcoming about everything that may have gone wrong and everything you've done. And most of the time they're willing to work with you. You just want to be able to disclose the information to them and let them make a decision instead of them coming to you to ask you about oh, what about this you forgot, and this you forgot, and this you forgot. You know, it's like, now I'm starting to wonder about your sanity. Like, do you really have the capacity to remember anything <laughs> when you don't know what you did? Okay, so full-time devotion, potential for success. This is one of those arbitrary terms that I imagine they put in there to willy-nilly qualify or disqualify folks. Most of the time what they're looking at is whether or not the times I've seen this come into question is um, the times where the government has come back for some reason saying that they don't see that the NAICS code that you've provided is something that the government has purchased or purchases in enough quantity to justify the certification. And I've seen that with one of my companies that does... Um, <laughs> I don't even know how to describe what they do. They, they basically refurbish old airplanes um, and they're based in Colombia, the country. So a lot of the old airplanes that they refurbish are U.S. airplanes that are now in the Colombian marketplace, but they do basically aftermarket airplane parts. And the government's like, oh, we don't see that we purchased a whole lot of that. And, you know, because me, nerd, you know, researching, I'm like... <laughs> Well, here's the information on your FPDS, which shows every contract ever known to man, and you've purchased billions of dollars in the last three years. So please tell me how you don't purchase a lot. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, usually it's just a matter of us rejigging the information and presenting it back to them so that they can um, know that you've got potential for success. Revenue generating is very important. For most of the federal certifications, they want to see that you're already a going concern generating revenue. I say most because it's not all. If you are a service disabled veteran owned company, I've had those businesses that come in that, you know, start up and in two, three months they get their certification. Um, there is no revenue requirement for those veteran owned small businesses. For something like 8A, they want to see that you've been generating revenue for at least two years. Um, so it depends on the certification. Woman-owned small business is another. You don't necessarily have to have been in business a certain time or generating revenue, but you do need to be full-time in the business. So, um, you know, when I first started my company, I couldn't get the woman-owned small business certification because I was still working full-time at the bank. But the second I left that full-time job and was in my business full-time, then I applied for that certification. Okay. And then the other thing is you must not have any affiliations that would prevent eligibility. Okay, so this gets really complicated and we can go into all the nuts and bolts of this. But basically, affiliations mean that you are somehow associated with another business. Um, the SBA and VA as well will often make the presumption that you're affiliated with businesses that, that um, one, that are clients of yours where the bulk of your revenue comes from that one client. Um, so like if you are, let's say you just stood up your business and you left your full-time job and started doing your company and now you're contracting with the same company that you left, which is the way a lot of consultants and small businesses start, right? But that's your only revenue source. The SBA can make the presumption that you're affiliated with that company. And oftentimes they do that because that's where the bulk of your revenue comes. If that one client goes away, then your business disappears too. So. Um, they have made, I've seen them try to make the argument for affiliation. One of my clients, they um, have their business that they were leasing office space from another business that was similar to theirs. They do non-destructive testing. So, you know, like if you have a plain fuselage, 
they test it to make sure there are no cracks or fissures and all that kind of stuff before the plane goes up in the air and blow, <laughs> blows up, right? So, but they were um, leasing space from a non-destructive testing equipment manufacturer. And that NDT equipment manufacturer was like hundreds of millions of dollars. And they were a small business trying to get their service disabled vet, their 8A and all those certifications. So they tried to make the, the, the claim that they were affiliated because they were both in the NDT business. So we had to make the argument that no, they have an official lease, he pays monthly rent. This is just a lessor, lessee relationship, not, a, not, not any kind of affiliation. I'm sorry? No, no, for the purposes of certifications, again, back to number two, you have to be a small business. So if he was found to be affiliated with that company, he no, no longer qualifies as a small business. Yeah, so that's the reason for that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Not necessarily, because the potential for success factor is mainly an 8A factor. And keep in mind that the woman on small business and economically disadvantaged woman on small business, those two certifications are self certification. So there's no third party reviewing it. There's nobody coming out or making a decision about it. So as long as you present the information uploaded into the portal, you print that, print your letter, and you're done. But 8A in agency, i.e. the SBA, is actually reviewing it. For HubZone, the agency is reviewing it. For VeteranOwned, the agency is reviewing it. So that's where potential for success comes in, when there's a third party agency that's making a review of your information. Does that answer the question? Okay. Oh, and I keep forgetting for purposes of webinar to repeat the question, but I think you probably got from context what she was asking. She was asking about, <laughs> sorry, potential for success for women owned small businesses. Okay. Um, so those are um, the federal certifications and qualifications. Do we have any questions about that? No? Okay, let's move on to the next one. Oh, I think I talked about a lot of these already. 8A, <laughs> again, small, according to the SBA size standards, socially disadvantaged. Um, I talked about this last week, but social disadvantage for SBA purposes, that's basically the, the, the SBA's politically correct term for ethnicity and race. So um, you are presumed socially disadvantaged if you are Black, Hispanic, Asian American, or Native American. Um, you are not presumed socially disadvantaged if you are a woman, not for purposes of a day, okay? So if you are a Caucasian female, you have to prove that you have been disadvantaged socially in order to get into the program. And I've been able to successfully help a couple of my clients do that. Um, so um, it, it's not, an easy process by any means. The rules on that, you know, I showed you the um, Code of Federal Regulations. They, of course, tell you how to prove your social disadvantage, but <laughs> it's obviously written by some lawyers that were purposely vague, and it's with a preponderance of evidence that you have to prove your disadvantage. Now, I've, what is a preponderance? Is that two examples, five examples, 13 examples? I mean, you know, I, I've never seen a preponderance quantified. So anyway, um, so just keep in mind that if you are, you know, fall into an ethnic minority, then you are definitely going to be presumed socially disadvantaged. I don't know how that's going to change in 2025 when the minorities are going to outnumber the majority. But anyway, I, <laughs> I think this is more from a social disadvantage standpoint. But it'll be interesting to see what arguments come about. Okay, and also you have to be economically disadvantaged. Okay, and I talked about this a little bit last week too. Economic disadvantage is based on three primary factors. That's going to be your income, your net worth, and your total assets. Every certification that has an economic disadvantage component 
generally, it, well, it's all going to be based on these three, but each one will probably have a different number for each of those three. So 8A is the least restrictive or the most restrictive. If you qualify for 8A, you qualify for everyone. <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. I don't know which one that makes it, but anyway. Um, for income, your income can't be any more than 250000 per year, and that's averaged over the previous three years. So take your past three years. If it's 750000 or less, because you divide that by three, then you're good. Okay? It's looking at your income as the disadvantaged individual or the two people that comprise the 51% or the three people or however many it comprises that. Not, you know, if you're married and you file a joint tax return, it's not looking at your wife's income or somebody else that may be bringing income outside of the business. Yes. Not the revenue of the business. This is income on your personal tax return. So your adjusted gross income. Yeah. Um, net worth for economic disadvantage for ADA, your net worth can be, well, let me go to total assets first because then you'll see how ridiculous it is. Total assets can be no more than $4 million. So that's going to be your house, your car, your boats, your, your retirement accounts, your, your everything that you own can be no, worth no more than $4 million. But your net worth can be no more than $250,000. Okay, come on, son. <laughs> I was going to say, I see the quizzical look on his face and your face. Your net worth can be no more than $250,000. No, four million for total assets. Oh. Yeah, and then your net worth no more than two hundred fifty thousand. And keep in mind, for those of you, that, you know, as a banker forever, your total assets minus your total liabilities is how you come up with your net worth. So I don't know anyone that is that highly levered to have three point eight million dollars in assets and a two hundred fifty thousand dollar net worth. <laughs> so yeah, so how they come up with these numbers, I don't know. I don't make the rules again back to it's one of those lift the skirt and say yes. <laughs> I need to watch what I say, being that these are recorded, right? <laughs> okay, so yeah. So um just keep in mind that <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah. So um keep in mind that, that those are the rules. The other thing is that that's what's required to get into the program. Now, the goal of this, you know, we talked about that if you get into this program and you do what you need to do and you're doing things the correct way and you're learning how to win contracts and you start getting successful at winning contracts, ideally your income is going to go up, right? Ideally, you're going to start acquiring some assets in your personal business if your business starts doing well. You know, if you win a $15 million contract and you've got a whole bunch of income, you're probably, depending on where you live, you might upgrade your house. You might upgrade a few things in your life. So continued eligibility for 8A, you've got to recertify every year. So continued eligibility means that your income can exceed no more than $350,000 per year as the program goes on. <laughs> and again, this averaged over three years. Your net worth can grow to, I think, $6 million. Gosh, I need to read these rules again. I used to know them like the back of my hand. And then your net worth can grow to $750,000. So keep in mind that those are kind of the numbers and how they work. But I tell people all the time, you should never, ever, 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 ever get kicked out of the 8 program because of economic disadvantage. Okay? We have resources. We can get you to a CPA that understands federal contracts in these programs. It's called deferred compensation, people. I mean, yes, maybe you want to take a whole lot more money home than $350,000, but talk to an accountant that knows how to structure it so it's not coming as take-home income, okay? There are ways to do this. Think about every giant executive of Fortune 500 companies. They don't pay millions of dollars in taxes because they do creative things with their money that are legal. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I'm talking about... <laughs> no, they do legal creative things. So you need to get CPAs and people on board that understand those rules and can help you do those same legal creative things 
so you don't ever get kicked out because of economic disadvantage. The only reason you should ever be kicked out of the 8 day program early is because you've grown too big to be small. Now, there's some things, I mean, you know, I've told you some creative ways to get around it, but, you know, if you get contracts that balloon you past the $37.5 million mark, one of those congratulations, you've now <laughs> become a big business and we got a whole different set of things that we can help you with, right? But <laughs> that's the only reason you should get kicked out of it, okay? They're only looking at the information for the 51%. However, if that's the husband and wife, that's a different scenario. They still only look at you as the disadvantaged individual, but they do ask for a personal financial statement and all that kind of stuff for your wife as well. And, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, if you're married to somebody who's sitting on the crown jewels, you probably won't qualify for economic disadvantage, right? So <laughs> you just need to be, <laughs> I mean, if they're balling like that, then I'm sorry, you just won't get it. <laughs> Generally, no, not generally. It's not family. I, the only time I've ever seen where they ask for the personal financial statement for someone that's not fifty-one percent has been a husband one. Yeah, and um, the one time they tried doing that with one of my clients, you know, we pushed back on 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 it because they didn't have. Well, wait a minute. If the person has more than than twenty percent ownership then yes they will for 8a yes so so the 49 the 50, no they won't be totaled together though for the are you talking about for where's my clicker for income yeah 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 no that's only for the 51 percent but i'm talking about they do ask for a personal financial statement for both the 49 percent and the 51 percent in the scenario you just drew. So if your 49% partner happens to be, you know, independently wealthy and, you know, has millions of dollars in assets, then that could preclude you from getting in the program. Right, right. I mean, and that's one of those things where, you know, when I have people that are coming to me to, to get 8A, I, I get all this stuff before we stick it into the system. So I kind of look at that and say, okay, this person has like $10 million in assets and a net worth, a net worth of five and a half million dollars. That's probably going to be looked at somewhat, not unfavorably, but their logical question, like my logical question would be, dude, you got a partner that's 49% involved in the business. They can't provide a loan or give you some financial assistance to help you move your business forward. And that, that's what they're going to be considering as well. Does that make sense? Okay, so, you know, we talked about the other qualifications for 8A, two years in business. Um, a two-year waiver is possible, depending on the circumstances, um, but uh, it's kind of like proving you're Superman. I've helped one or two businesses, but with the new rules, it's been harder and harder. And then, um, again, a going concern that's generating revenue and demonstrating the potential for success, okay? Now, for your state, local, municipal type certifications, here they look at both citizens and resident aliens. So it, it doesn't matter if you're here legally with a green card, then you can be um, considered for those certifications. You must be doing business in that city, state, municipality that you're looking to get certified in. <clears throat> and you must be small according to the size standards. And depending on the certification, you may need to meet some eligibility criteria, okay? So um, you do have to meet that disadvantage qualification, i.e. you are a woman, therefore you qualify for the woman business enterprise or whatever. You are a veteran, you qualify for the veteran. So whatever that category is, you've got to meet that. And then you must not have any affiliations that can lead to negative control. Okay, so let me explain what this is. So um, trying to come up with a good example. Um, this can happen in the way of ownership, and it can also happen in the way of clients. So in an ownership scenario, let's say there are three of you in the business, and it's, it's 60, well, no, let's say it's 40%, 30%, and 30%. And the two, 
Okay, 60. Okay, yeah. So it's it's 40% and then two 30% for the 100% total. Sorry, I'm trying to do the math in my head. And according to your bylaws or your articles of organization, it says that um, there is a super majority at 65, 60, at I'm trying to figure this out. I just had it in my head. Give me a second. I might need a piece of paper. Can I borrow a piece of paper, please, and a pen? <laughs> okay, let me talk about the client one because that's a little easier. Let's say, and I'll just rip this off and get the notebook back, although I've taken your pen now and I can't write it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, if you've got clients, let's say, and I talked about this earlier, you've got two main clients in your business. And one of the two clients generates, I don't know, 75% of the revenue in your company. And the other and, um, only generates 25%. And let's say that you try to bring on another client that is a competitor to the big one, to the one that generates 75%. And they're like, oh, you know, I don't know that I want you doing business with my competitor. Because they represent so much of your business, they can exert negative control by saying, you know, if you bring on that client, then we might need to reconsider our relationship and how we do things. If that's 70% of your revenue, what are you going to do? You're probably not going to take on the other client, right? So they have the potential to exert negative control that way. So that's why the SBA is, well, I mean, in this one, it's city, state, and local, but that's one of the reasons why the SBA is concerned with the concentration in your receivables. Okay, so let's look at this ownership scenario again. Okay. Hmm. I have to come up with the actual numbers, but basically when it comes to owners, what they're trying to prevent is a situation where one of the three owners, if there's three or four or multiple owners, where one of the three can prevent you from making a decision to move your company forward or to do whatever it is that you want to do in the business. So if it's you and another person that constitutes that 51% or better ownership, but it, if that third person doesn't agree that you can't get to the 51% or better, then that person can basically exert negative control, person or person. Can exert negative control and the whole premise of any of these certifications is that you or that the disadvantaged individuals own and control the company but if you and whomever it is that it takes to qualify for um owner for control can't make a decision to move forward if that other person puts the kibosh on it then that other person can exert negative control does that make sense and i I had a scenario like this before, and I can't remember how the numbers, um, how the percentages carried out, but yeah, that was an issue for them. So they had to restructure ownership or, or change some things in their business. You must not have any ties to the municipality, you know, like if you're hooked into the mayor and you're trying to do business, I was about to say names. Yes, let's not do that. Um, <laughs> and trying to do business in that particular city or municipality, it 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 could be construed. You know, just later you'll be in court, going to jail, and passing out when they're trying to sentence you because of something you did wrong. <laughs> so, just 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 you're not you're not. Just, I mean. It's not that important. You're not trying to go to jail just to win a contract, okay? Just let's keep things in perspective, people. <laughs> and most of the time, it's going to require that you're licensed in whenever municipality that you're looking to do business with, okay? Alrighty, so corporate certification. Again, um, citizens and permanent residents are going to be eligible here. So, you know, as long as you've got your green card or here legally, then you can. Um, you can get certified for your company. You must own and control your business. And um, the corporate certifications are done by third-party 
entities. And unlike the government third-party entities, SBA and BA, these third-party entities want to be paid. So they will, they will ask that you um, pay an annual fee of like $350, $500. Uh, some of them are, are revenue, um, are, are tiered based on the revenues of your company. So um, they have very specific rules about what ownership looks like and what control looks like. So if you're a woman-owned small business, they ask questions like, can you confirm that no males actually control the day-to-day operations of the firm? They actually go out and do site visits. And in the cases of husbands and wives, they're very, very, very wary of those meetings they go into where the husband and wife are there. And it's obvious that the wife is just a figurehead in the business because the husband is trying to get the woman, um, woman on small business designation. So you've got to, you know, if you are a woman on small business and that know your business and the ins and outs of it <clears throat> in order to qualify. That 51% owner must be the licensed professional if required. In your case, it's a very good example. So because you've got a brokerage firm, that means the 51% owner, that disadvantaged individual, if you're looking at a minority certification, you would have to be that broker in the, in the company. Um, the other great thing about these is oftentimes you can start your business today and get your certification tomorrow as long as you meet all the other criteria, i.e. licensing and all that kind of stuff. And um, Back to the professional licenses, if you're like a CPA, a doctor, a lawyer, real estate broker, engineer, architect, those are the main ones where they look to see that either the woman or the minority is the doctor, the lawyer, the CPA, the, the engineer, the architect, all that good stuff, okay? And then, of course, it requires a fee to the certifying agency. Okay, so that is pretty much... Um, all the details and questions and all that kind of stuff. But um, in that whole realm, you know, I always like to say it takes a village to build a business. And that's why it's so important that you have resources like this or you go get information from other people. But GCA is hosting a small business connection series um, event that is all about building your dream team. And that's going to include specialists that we'll talk about funding, specifically mobilization funding for your business. Um, in government contracting, it's kind of unique because you're awarded this contract. Let's say it's a project that's a couple hundred thousand dollars and it's, um, I don't know, and you're, you're a real estate broker. So you are gonna be leasing space to a, a certain apartment or a building, the, the, some agency, in the area, right, needs 5,000 square feet with so many parking spaces and all that kind of stuff. There are upfront costs that you have to incur in order to make that happen, right? So mobilization funding is what allows you to go ahead and get that contract up and running until you get your money from the government, which you won't be able to get until after you perform the service and then you invoice them and 15 to 30 days later you get your pay. But um, in order to perform the contract, oftentimes you need that money up front to do what it is you have to do for them. Um, in cases of, of people that place people, you know, if you're putting cheats and seats, like I like to say, for the government, you have to hire those folks, get them paid for the first 15 days or 30 days before you are able to invoice the government and get money. So you've got to make sure that you have money for that. So we've got funding specialists. Mr. Craig Lacey, that's the first gentleman on the lower left <laughs> that, um, that is going to be uh, from uh, South Star Capital talking about funding. We have a proposal expert that's going to be um, Ms. Kira Godfrey. Yes. She, see, I, what would I do without Pam? Can we give Pamela Harris a hand? <laughs> Every time I need something, I just look over and she reads my mind. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't have to know anything anymore because Pam is here. So Kira Godfrey, she's the proposal expert. She teaches proposal writing and has um, for a couple of university systems. So she'll be talking about um, how to write effective proposals that can win contracts. We've got an HR professional, Miss um, Charlene Fitzpatrick, and she was the winner of our um, last year, our, our 
first SBCS event that we did, or was it our second? Anyway, um, the, the, thank you, gosh, it's ridiculous. I don't even have a brain anymore because of him. <laughs> so she was the winner of our very first capability pitch contest. So she's gonna be talking about, um, you know, the HR needs that you have and all the important issues that you need to understand as it relates to contracting when you're placing people or, or adhering to Davis-Bacon rules and all the, all the stuff that goes along with contracting that you may not need right now in your current business, but are going to be important as you move forward in your contracting business. Um, we have an attorney with um, Osinski Law, and you know I don't know this person's name. <laughs> Tanya Olsinski will be here from Olsinski Law, and she um, understands government contracting, and that's very important. And not necessarily something that you need to have and hire right now, but you need to be aware that these resources are important for you to have so that if an issue comes along, and let's be real, this is government contracting, it's likely something will come along. Don't let that deter you from, from doing something, but just understand that we've got resources that can help you be prepared when it happens. She'll be here talking about um, protecting your business, running contracts that, that protect your interests as well as the government's interest and all of that. And then of course, we've got Jim. That is Jim, right? Okay, don't know Jim's last name. <laughs> okay, Global Dynamic. Yeah, Global Dynamic. Consulting U.S. Yes. <laughs> so um, they are an accounting firm that specializes in government contracting. So they only work with um, their clients are all government contracting clients. And the reason why that's so important <laughs> is because, again, back to what I was saying, they understand what the 8A rules are. So they're not going to let you, um, grow, you know, your income get to a point that allows you to get kicked out of a program. They understand how to um, make sure that, that you allocate revenues in certain ways that are within the rules and regulations so that you're not exceeding the size standards prior to you being ready to do that. So um, that's very important. So these are some of the experts that are going to be at our event. Um, you'll hear from them on a panel. You definitely want to attend that. The early bird pricing special has passed, but the tickets to this are only $25. So definitely make make it worth your while to attend. The date is February 21st, so that's coming up pretty quickly. That is a Thursday, and it's not all day, but it's going to be the, the morning of it, so from 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock. So um, please mark your calendars. Make time to attend that. And we're also going to have um, <clears throat> the keynote speaker is going to be Olympian Denise Miller, just talking about the value of having a team around you so she'll do the, the morning presentation and we'll have the panel discussion and um, a lot of great networking generally we'll have uh, folks from agencies that show up you know um, CDC has been here before we generally have GSA that comes to a lot of our events like this SBA is usually in the house for, for these kinds of events so definitely come so that you can meet um, some individuals and, and find out um, how you can possibly move your business forward with contracts. And, you know, consistently, the people that come to these events are the ones that, that win contracts. From our very first one, we um, have a couple of clients that are working out of Puerto Rico um, as a result of the hurricanes that happened with FEMA. And then did any contracts come about as of capability pitch that you know of? I thought City of Atlanta did business with somebody because um, we had the DOT, City of Atlanta. Um, Elahi? Okay. Tony Daniels? I think so, but I mean, so, oh, okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, you definitely made an impression on the folks at the City of Atlanta, but definitely come to these because we usually have, you know, the contacts that we make with different agencies, we invite them out to these events because they are looking for events like ours. And we, we've been told several times that ours are some of the better quality events where they meet business owners that are ready to do business. So um, they, are, they seem to be pretty impressed by the caliber of business people we have and that this speaks well to all of you. So 
definitely show up, bring your business cards, bring your capability statements, and um, yeah. Okay, so I'm running very, very early. So what questions do we have? And let's see who might be online. I don't think we've got any online folks today. Oh, we do have Gloria online. Hey, Gloria, haven't seen you in a while. <clears throat> okay, so what questions do we have? Absolutely. Can you? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oops. How do I exit? Yeah, I talked about, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> that would be too much light logical. His question for those of you online is if I get one of these certifications, won't all the other cities or counties accept them? Uh, the answer is unfortunately no. Um, the only state that I know that has a uniform statewide certification is North Carolina, where they've gotten wised up to the whole process of why have every county known to man do this when we can just do it universally. So um, Fulton County, I will tell you, is super simple. The hardest part of Fulton County is getting into their BSS system, their vendor supply service system, and getting that vendor number. But I think they only ask for like 10 documents. And if you've already put it together for DeKalb, you have all those documents that you need for Fulton. Uh, DeKalb County, uh, which one did you say you did it for City of Atlanta? Oh, you started. OK, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and, and if you are organized, and I, I tell people all the time, if you're gonna do certifications, make sure you create a folder on your computer somewhere. Ideally put it in a cloud, you know, like a Dropbox or a box or one of those, those kinds of things so that no matter where you are, you can get access to it. Um, and put all those documents in that one place because the, the, there's nothing new under the sun. Everybody asks for the same thing. Um, every once in a while, you're going to get someone who asks for something different. Like MBE is the only one that asks for a statement of cash flows. No one asks for a statement of cash flows. Not even banks use those anymore, right? They just ask for the balance sheet and the income statement. But, you know, MBE wants a statement of cash flow as well. So, you know, hopefully you do a QuickBooks because trying to put one of those together without something like that is your CBA is going to charge you out the NDA <laughs> for that. So, yeah. Um, you said something that prompted me to think about something. Oh, oh, certification boot camp. So if certifications are something that you want to do, um, we have a certification one day boot camp that's coming up this next week on the 15th. Yes. So um, the great thing about the one day boot camp is I have some pre-work that I give you. We talk about what certification and you just have the perfect class, right? Which certification is right for you? So I'll give you the checklist for that certification. Um, my ebook as pre work, if you go through and do everything that I ask as far as get all those documents into a cloud kind of Dropbox, bring your laptop with you during class. At the end of the class, you will have that one certification in process. So that's a great way to get one of the certifications going, get that first monkey off your back, if you will, and then you kind of have yourself set up to get all the rest of them and do it yourself if you want to. And that class, um, like I said, is next week. Um, it's all day Friday, so um, February 15th. And for members, it's only $299. So for you know, 300 bucks, you basically have a certification in process. So um, if you are struggling with getting certified and you've been at it for, it feels like years, and can never get around to it, then you know, come join me for a day and knock it out. No Gee, um, 
they GSA is federal, so it's going to be one of the like a hub zone or an 8A, but you know GSA has their own schedule. But I know several of my 8A clients that do a lot of work with GSA, so that would be one. And that that yeah, if you have been in business a while and you're kind of ready for an 8A program. That, that $300 deal is a steal because, you know, if you want me to do that certification for you, it costs $5,000. So come to the one-day class <laughs> and get that one thing in process and you'll be well on your way to, to moving forward. But, yeah, GSA is definitely somebody as a real estate broker that you want to do business with. And then... Um, what is the other one? Are you looking at um, HUD projects too as they come up? Because those contracts usually come up every three or five years. And um, the last real estate company I did based out of North Carolina, I think it was, they're probably going to be coming around next year, around July time. But um, generally those look for 8 Yeah, those are 8 a set assignments. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Nothing? The uh, building can bring me 21st. Is it $25? $25. Yeah, it's $25 for members. Is there a bigger non member fee? Okay, yeah. Okay. Okie dokie, folks. I guess that means we're just out early. So if y'all are interested in the, the boot camp on the 15th, then let me know so I can uh, get you registered for that and get your um, your, your um, pre-work to you so you can be you know ready to have what you need for that certification. Go ahead. Oh. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I was just Facebook page. So I need everyone in here to be on our Facebook page, Government Contractors Association Facebook page. We're going to be putting out more information about this 809 panel that's in place. And um, based on the research that I've been getting from Myra Cisse and Amy, this panel has been put together to eliminate. They're putting a recommendation before Congress to have all small business set aside.
day before the end of this week. I'm going to be sending that out. I'm going to go out to sign it and pass it on to every small business owner that you know. And you tell them to tell somebody else and get this done. We have to be heard. Because this recommendation, I don't know who you're listening to. Obviously, it must be large corporations who are funding this to eliminate us right. out of uh, getting these contracts. Do you understand how urgent this is? Do you understand that we don't win small business contracts? Or at least, at least have the opportunity, then what does our future look like for our future generation? So this is not just about us now. This is about us now and going forward. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any questions about this? Yes, ma'am. Also, Oh, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Oh, uh, yeah. What I was saying, man, I said, I mean, I was speaking about the country. This is not just Georgia. This is a worldwide effort. You know, there are people outside the country that do business with this, uh, with this government as well. But I'm speaking to you because I know each one of you have an interest in government contracts and also in small business. So whether you are not doing government contracts at all or know somebody, this affects all of them. Because right. if it happens in the government sector, it's going to also happen in commercial. It's going to happen in, in the mm -hmm. uh, industrial retail. It can happen in all phases of business. Does that make sense? So this is something, this is not a, you know, I don't think about it. No, no, this is a requirement. We got to do something. We have to be heard. You may not vote in any election, which I think that's stupid. Right? <laughs> you, know, you better do something about this because this can hurt a lot. I don't know. All right. Uh, all right. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. And then, too, another thing, we've got um, a link on our website to a letter that you can uh, send to your congressperson about it. So we've kind of created the letter for you. So all you've got to do is print it, stick it on your letterhead, send it to your congressperson um, so that they can be aware that, that you know, that the voices of small businesses in their community are being heard. You're the constituents. You're the ones who put them in office, so they need to hear your voice. So definitely do that. And um, and again, if you want more information about it, um, we're probably going to be doing weekly um, weekly information that we do on Facebook Live, and then post to Facebook later just about information that that the eight a pan the section eight oh nine panel is putting together. So. They've got like 98 recommendations they've put out so far and um, three volumes of, of data that they've gathered amongst themselves. Um, and, you know, we've got attorneys that are, are experts in the space that we're going to have as guests talking about some of the repercussions and, and how it can affect you. So definitely stay tuned and do your part, please, to keep these set-asides that are there for you available to you. So, okay.